Tenth Meeting, Wednesday, June 19th, 1974. I will start with a talk about meditation. Meditation, palana, is the process of looking into and learning about the body and examining the mind, jitta, in order to read its stories. The jitta is writing various stories all the time, but we rarely ever read them. It is the character of the jitta to like thinking and imagining in various ways, even though we are often unaware of the good and bad thoughts we have at any particular time. This tendency will show itself when we practice meditation as the jitta struggles and moves about a lot so that it cannot remain still and contented. People's minds usually think restlessly like this, which is a habit that is more difficult to break and bring to a halt than anything else. Because the jitta is such a subtle thing, it must rely on mindfulness and wisdom to bring it under control by supervising and looking after it. The more we examine what is right and wrong, good and bad, in ourselves, the more we are likely to find that there is no limit to the things which are faulty. Therefore, the principles of Buddhism teach us to contemplate so as to see what is good and what is faulty in us. Sometimes we see things that are unpleasant, and sometimes we see things that are pleasant. Because the teachings of Buddhism teach more about the heart than anything else, they are the best tools for doing this work. The only tools that are really able to match up to the ways of the heart are the principles of Thamma, but it depends on us whether we will be able to suitably equip ourselves with those tools or not. Making things requires the use of tools. If the craftsman is well skilled, those things will be beautiful and useful. This is equally true for a person's body, speech, and mind. The body is like a growing tree, which may be either softwood or hardwood. The thing that matters is that the craftsman takes it and changes it into something useful, such as a table or chair, depending on what is wanted. When it is finished, it will have become something beautiful and useful, according to the type of wood and the ability of the craftsman. Similarly, when the body, speech, and mind have been altered and corrected in accordance with the principles of Thamma by putting forward our utmost effort with full commitment, they will become our treasures, having more value than all other things. This is because the value of people depends on their virtue, unlike animals which are valued for their flesh and their hides. Since people consider the value of animals to be in their flesh, their hides, and other parts of their bodies, when animals die, nobody is distressed. But this is not the case with people, for they must have good and seemly behavior to give assurance of their value. Good behavior of body, speech, and mind is the value that elevates human beings and makes them beautiful. The value and beauty of the mind does not alter with time, unlike that of the physical body, which goes the way of nature and changes all the time. If we value virtue as an ornament decorating ourselves, that goodness remains and does not deteriorate even when the body gradually deteriorates. When training in meditation, it is particularly important that you should try to restrain your thoughts and imaginings so that you may gain some calm and peace. Then you will begin to see an increase in the value of your heart. When doing meditation, try to let the jitta confine its imagining to the work that you want to promote, such as butto, butto which is the kind of work that causes the jitta to become calm. When you try to do this with interest and with mindfulness in control of the jitta, you will be able to attain a state of calm without being troubled by emotionally disturbing objects. A heart devoid of disturbing things is happy, calm, and peaceful. Calm and happiness of heart, devoid of all emotionally disturbing things, is the kind of happiness and security that we long for the most. Ekagata jitta is what the Lord Buddha called the jitta that is established with only a single point of knowing. Ekagata jitta means to know oneness. It is a happiness of heart that has no equal. Although the Lord Buddha entered Parinibbana more than 2500 years ago, the whole excellence of his profound tamma remains a refuge in which all Buddhists have faith and pay homage to without ceasing. When the end of the Buddha era of this Lord Buddha is reached, there will still be another Buddha who will come anew, attain enlightenment, and teach the world. This will happen again and again endlessly. When the heart becomes calm and breaks free from emotionally disturbing things, you will immediately know the wonder of the heart, even though you have never known it before. 
It is a most strange and wonderful experience in the life of someone who has never known calm of heart. When the jitta is calm, it is unlikely to produce any thoughts that give rise to emotional disturbances that might trouble you, causing confusion and distraction. The jitta simply remains in a state of eka jitta, eka tamma, until it rises up and withdraws from it. After withdrawing, the mind will think and imagine emotionally based thoughts as usual. If the jitta can drop down into a state of calm even just once, it will arouse the meditator's enthusiasm in an amazing way, which he will hardly be able to forget even for a day. In fact, it will make him try to practice meditation more and more. Because of that, someone who has already seen good results from practice is likely to put forward strong effort without slacking. Let us respectfully put aside the knowledge that we have learned from the Buddhist texts for the time being, for I would like to explain the way of Tamma from the viewpoint of practice. By learning about Tamma, we come to know about Tamma. The Tamma has never been a secret thing from the time of the Lord Buddha's enlightenment up to the present time, so the Tamma that was taught and handed down to us still remains true. It is not in the least deficient. By practicing Tamma, we come to know the results that the Buddha taught. Buddhist practice still gives the same results that it did in the past, except that people who practice it now are not as capable as those who practiced in ancient times. In that case, the results will not be the same, for if the causes are insufficient, the results will be weak. Results without causes do not exist, so who should we blame? Apart from us, who is obstructing Tamma and not following the way that the Lord taught? So we should correct our own causes first. At the time of the Buddha, Tamma was true Tamma. People learned Tamma so as to experience Tamma by practicing it truly. They did not hold back and turn Tamma into something worldly. I would like to tell you that I myself am not entirely good in all ways. In coming to London to visit you, I have brought with me both good and bad tendencies. If I happen to make any mistakes, I hope that all of you who are listening will forgive me. I will now give you an example of turning Tamma into something worldly. To begin with, I studied the texts and managed to pass my exams, graduating in the third grade of Tamma studies. I was very pleased with myself, and that aroused a group of Gilesas. Later on, I graduated in the second and then the first grade of Tamma studies. Then I became big and puffed up, increasing the kilesas until a big mass of them arose. I thought I was clever, but inside I was full of nothing but kilesas. Later on I became Mahaparyan, and I thought I was even more clever. But in truth, I was only clever at remembering the names of the kilesas, Danha, and Asavas. I knew only their names, but I did not understand them, so I could not get rid of any of the kilesas from my heart. I simply thought that I was clever to graduate from this grade to that grade. If we are not circumspect, we don't know when Tamma turns into something worldly. As soon as I turned my attention to become interested in practice, I aimed to understand the true meaning of Tamma. As my swollen pride gradually diminished, being a Tamma scholar of this grade or that grade began to lose its importance, until I felt ashamed of myself and did not want to hear the title Maha at all. This kind of thinking became another type of Gilesa, for I was convinced that I was right. Previous to that, I liked to have the title Maha placed in front of my name, but now I wanted Maha to be in the background. The Gilesas, then, are the false side of Tamma, Tamma that has changed into something mundane. After I had practiced Tamma more, those Gilesas gradually broke up and disappeared from my heart. In telling you this, I don't intend to criticize others. I am simply telling you about myself, and how I used to think, to illustrate what I mean by Tamma turning into something worldly. If you do not understand the true nature of Tamma, you will never be able to counter the Gilesas, which can hide themselves in subtle and strange ways. Samati, which previously was only a word for me, then became apparent within my heart. When I studied the texts, I memorized them by constant repetition until I became very skilled at reciting the words of Tamma, but I came to know the truth of these things only when I practiced meditation as hard as I could. 
I came to see for myself that Tamma and Gelesas are both found within the Jitta, and that the person who practices must realize this for himself, and then strive diligently to promote Tamma and get rid of the Gelesas. Smate, which is an anchor for the heart, became steadily more firm and stable. Then I knew with my own heart both the name and the experience of Smate. When I examined the elements, Padu and Kantas, I saw that the body, Ropagaya, is entirely made up of the four elements, which are all within the scope of the De Lakkana, Anitta, Dukkha, and Anatta. Concerning Banya, wisdom, having already learned its name, I then saw the heart putting it into practice, using wisdom to investigate as hard as it was able to, continuously, without letting up. Mindfulness and wisdom are aspects of Tamma that we must know for ourselves. Then there are no doubts left about the nature of Magga, which is the combination of mindfulness and wisdom that steadily makes the Gelesas break away and leave the heart. In the end, we see clearly within our hearts that Dukkha, Samudaya, Nirota, and Magga have been noble truths right from the beginning. When mindfulness and wisdom understand the truth rightly until it is accepted by the heart, all doubts come to an end. Those who have no doubt can live peacefully without being disturbed by anything ever again. This is the end of the story. Then Tamma is Tamma and the world is the world. Each of them is true in its own sphere, each existing independently by itself, so disturbances between the citta and external things no longer take place. The phrase Te Sang Vopasamosuko does not refer only to the Sulka of the Arahant after he has died and his Sankaras have ceased. The quelling of those Sankaras that are the basis of Samudaya, the origin of Dukkha, which caused the Gelesas to arise, is also Sulka, even though he has not yet passed away. Today I have explained the nature of the true Tamma, as opposed to the Tamma that changes into the way of the world. If we practice like the Buddha Zarahant disciples did, then we will get the same results as those who practiced at the time of the Buddha. But it is a shame that, though Tamma is the truth, we usually prefer to just play around with it. Because of that, we often hear the annoying argument that Magga, Pala, and Nibbana can no longer be attained in this modern age, or no matter how diligently or how well we practice, there is no hope of attaining enlightenment now. It sounds as if some omniscient being has monopolized Magga, Pala, and Nibbana just for himself, even though he is so full of Gelesas that nobody would dare to compete with him. In that case, Buddhism would be just a name. Those who believe in the true nature of Tamma that Buddhism teaches would thus be robbed by the Gelesas until there is almost nothing worthwhile left in their hearts at all. If people continue to oppose the truth of Tamma in this way, in the future, I am afraid Buddhism will be a religion of textbooks, and all that will remain are the words.